Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan MSP. This is Ukraine War Frontline Update for the 11th of November 2024. This is a four-day update. I haven't done an update for four whole days. It's the same as the last time, actually. I'm sorry, it's just when I get really busy, it's the mapping. Unfortunately, it takes, uh, a, it takes a toll on the mapping. If you don't know the lines on my map, please pause the video and check out the key. Um, from the Institute for the Study of War, the distilled version on my website, uh, that's atpgeo.com, uh, you can find out what the ISW thinks, but in an even more concise fashion. Um, nothing too much to report other than look at the number of places that are listed on the frontline summary at the moment. So that shows you that the Russians are pretty much attacking everywhere. Uh, Russian mill bloggers are accusing Russian field commanders of creating beautiful reports that inflate Russian advances potentially to secure promotions while risking soldiers lives and equipment is one of the entries in the well the section I have here called notable anecdotes um, so worthy of note that right we're going to go to uh, first to Kursk region which is up in the north of the country so that's up here and this is an area where the Ukrainians are still focusing quite a lot of resources okay so they are really not wanting to lose ground here in fact it seems that they're happier to lose ground maybe in the south and the southeast uh, than they are to lose ground here there are claims that there are now fifth well they are holding back 50,000 people here and they are doing their very best uh, to maintain uh, decent troops in the area, rotating them, I think, fairly frequently. Uh, just to get a sense of what's going on here, very bloody battles are going on on the Kursk Blast. After a failed attack on the first day of operation, the enemy used a bare minimum in terms of using AFE at my flank and in the centre, says Kriegsforsche, who is there. Uh, I don't know if he's still there right now, but certainly... Um, yeah, it seems to, to be. But as of today, the uh, four attacks took place on it, only in my flank. So there, there you go. That's where he is. After a short break, Russians uh, attack. Their attacks continued. What's going on in the Kursk area is unique. On the ninth, for example, they used four BMD, four M's, BMP3. Somehow they managed to reach our positions. When they dismounted infantry, they started retreating. And one BMD, four M was destroyed by our tanks. Somehow, our two tanks were coming back from the task. Russians didn't see them. Tanks also didn't see the enemy. Only when the Russian armed forces dismounted, 15 VDV stormtroopers and one BMD was destroyed by uh, the tank. So on the 8th, the Russians lost three BMPs, two BMDs, one Ahmad, uh, three to four BTR-82s and 272 B3s. So that's a lot of equipment and it seems to be par for the course. And then the day after T-72, what a Brem-1 and the BTR-82. And that's with just this guy's area. And then he goes on to talk about today and it seems to be even worse. Uh, today, they use four columns. And we're going to look at this in a second with AFVs and tanks. And he lists all, all the kit, including T-90Ms, a breakthrough tank, their best tank, and some older vehicles from the Soviet era. Very full, very cool fights are taking place in the Kursk area. Witness how the Russians executed six Ukrainian POWs. First column in the early morning. Uh, second column, and he lists all the vehicles in the, in the third column. Fourth column, so one after the other. Uh, today, they have lost on my flank three BMPs, four BTRs, T-80, T-80 BVM, two MTLBs, and five BMP-3s. Um, and then in the centre, uh, T-72, uh, BVM, BTR-82, A and two Akhmat MRAPs. So anyway, just to say, uh, need to say that Russian VDV trying to use fog and a lot of smoke at the battlefield, and it really helps. Andrew Perpetua talked about this a lot, saying that Ukrainians really should use a lot more smoke than they do. Russians use it occasionally, and when they do, it it's, it's useful, obviously. But we are very lucky that they do it. Uh, they do a lot of Banzai attacks. Two days ago, 51, 51st Regiment just dismounted 15 soldiers and all of them were kill, killed in action or wounded in action because of the drones. But it's only the beginning. They are withdrawing 104th Regiment uh, from the 76th VDV Division from uh, Zaporizhia Oblast and moving into Kursk. Same with some battalions from the 177th Marine Regiment. So the best Russian units are fighting and going to fight in Kursk or Blast. If you, um, so there you go. Uh, really, uh, I think, goes to show how important both Ukraine and Russia see Kursk Oblast. Um, two, this is a report that two Ukrainian POWs have been killed in the Kursk Oblast from Kiev Independent here. The Prosecutor General's Office 
reporting that. Uh, but Greece for sure talked about six reports of murder, torture, and ill treatment of Ukrainian POWs are received regularly by Ukrainian authorities, but have uh, they have definitely spiked in recent months. Now, Ukraine holds off nearly 50,000 Russian troops in Kursk or Blast, says Zelensky. But it is uh, the claim is also out there that the Ukrainians themselves are are manning this with a lot of troops uh, and that they are rotating the, their troops every 10 days here. So they're, they're almost getting better uh, provision here than anywhere else along the front line. Now, you can argue that that sucks and it sucks to be you know, why aren't they doing that anywhere else on the front line? Simply put, and like I said at the beginning of the Kursk offensive, that taking ground here or controlling ground here is more Im important than controlling the same amount of ground down here. And so this is a greater, especially if you think about negotiations being down down the road, if, if that's really what um, is going to be forced on the Ukrainians from, say, the American administration changeover, then they want to have what is worth an awful lot more, which is Russian territory. So I think that's why they're doing that. Uh, you can disagree with that being a good idea or not, but I, I do understand it. Now, four days worth of fighting. There's a lot of fighting going on around here, which is Nov Nov Nova Ivanovka, where the Ukrainians have pushed back and a couple of sources here, well, Grayskull actually both on two different days. So this is on the 8th, says Ukrainians successfully counterattacked at Nova Ivanovka. And then even more so on the 10th there, further Ukrainian counterattacks at Novoyevinivka. So that is good news for the Ukrainians there, at least, um, pushing the Russians back. Uh, Andrew Perpetua has this all as a grey zone. Uh, Surat Mats has a Russian control going halfway into Novoyevinivka. Um, this is interesting because if they're fighting here, and that's, you know, Syria maps is showing that the Ukrainians are pushed back here. One would presume that that is the Ukrainians being there to push them back, which suggests that this is grey zone. This isn't the grey zone is likely back here. I think Andrew Perpetua is much more realistic here. Like it's not that the counterattack is going to be eating into Russian actual controlled areas unless it's a really you know big counterattack that gets through the grey zone and takes lots of land. So I think it's highly unlikely that that would happen without this being actually grey zone. And you'd have a change in grey zone. Uh, anyway, that's just my tuppence. Uh, further to the south around Dorino, though, Russians having some success. And then further up to the north in the area of Progrebki, which is actually where a lot of um, heavy fighting is taking place. I think that's where some of the around there is where some of the footage we are seeing is coming out from. Um, but anyway, that was um, from uh, uh, Kreis Forsha. Now let's look at... We're not going to look too closely, but there is lots of footage coming out from you from Kursk at the moment. Three columns of Russian armored vehicles unsuccessfully trying to storm Ukrainian positions. It's the 225th Assault Brigade. Now, I wonder whether that is actually Kreis uh grouping there. And he is talking about that in, in, the, in this breakdown. Um, no, it doesn't say which brigade he's in. But it's... it's somewhat likely to be what's going on here because they're talking about four different attacks and there are four different columns in these uh, these attacks and quite a few bits of kit taken out here is really tough for the Russians. I think Kursk is hurting them. I think they are losing a lot of kit uh, and, uh, and a lot of personnel as well. 225th Assault Battalion reports about several large Russian mechanized assault uh, assaults in the Kursk region. It's reported that four of such attacks happens today, driving in columns one after the other. Um, yeah, so difficult for the Russians in Kursk, but they are uh, they are obviously going to be putting an immense amount of pressure on the Ukrainians, uh, and the Ukrainians at the moment holding on. Now here is a another bit of footage. As I say, there is plenty coming out at the moment. This is the reason I've included this because they're shock shock company rugby team. Uh, I just like the idea of that. Together with artillery men of the 129th defeated a Russian assault group attempted attempting to cross the Sel River in the Kursk region. Well the Sel River is actually um but there you go. Um yeah uh not quite sure. You've obviously got uh, the Selm River. Oh is that uh, that's probably a different spelling of it. Um, Sel, Sel, is that the Selm River? Could well be this this river. In which case, that's quite interesting if they're... It could be over here 
I don't know where they'd be fighting near the river. Um, but yeah, anyway. Um, yeah, I'll, 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 let's go and plug that in, shall we? That would make sense, wouldn't it? So if we put this into the search function and then we can find out where that is and find out where these guys are getting hammered. No, that is the Cell River, which is nowhere near oh yes it is it's on the other side so i suddenly thought we we're uh, somewhere completely different okay so this is yeah definitely near the front line then over in the prokovo area on the other side of the kursk uh, salient so that is yeah chikaskaya konopelka sort of area where we have seen a lot of fighting uh, previously so obviously that's still going on russians trying to push through along this sector there um Anyway, that's what's going on in Kursk. I don't know that there's anything else to report. No, it's all the the um, all of the sources looked at. So when we come further to the east, we see that there are no changes over the last four days to the Vovchansk area or the Lipsy area, where the Russians have been slowly getting pushed back there, but uh, stabilised for the time being. Now, there's as we come to the northeast, it's not too good for the Ukrainians up here. Uh, I, I think Kupiansk is under a lot of pressure. There's talk that Petro Pavlivka has fallen to the Russians, although we're not we're not seeing that with the mapper mapping claims. Uh, here we go. Tim White, Russia says it's taking complete con control of Petro Pavlivka in the Kharkiv region. In the last update from Deep State, the the village was not under imminent threat, but it's looking now as though Ukraine's forces have pulled back to the river to defend Kupiansk just five to six kilometers away. So that's the, um, that is the Oskil River as it comes all the way down there. So um, yeah, the Ukrainians push, pulling back maybe to the Oskil River around there. Um, that's the claim from Tim White. Don't know how true that will be. Taking some more ground uh, around the Oskil River further to the south near Kozilnikivka. Yeah, expanding that bridgehead northwards, uh, again, as according to Surat maps. Both mappers over the last four days have seen some gains further to the south, um, around Stelmakivka, slightly south of there, uh, Vishneve, um, as the Russians pushing forward to the west. Um, still a bit of a difference there between the two mappers, as there is broadly right across front lines. Uh, some... Uh, Success for the Ukrainians pushing the Russians back, maybe in Pusha Travnely, uh, slightly further to the south. There's small gains for the Ukrainians there who come further to the south. Um, much smaller gains around even Nivka Terny. Russians pushing forward down in a southerly direction alongside the reservoirs here towards Terny and uh, looking challenging for the Ukrainians there. As we come further to the east we have some gains for the uh for the ukrainians in the bilaharivka area which is interesting i don't know that's a rejig there's a big difference between the mappers here this is more likely gray zone but it's quite a significant piece of physical geography that and and these hills in general that um yeah it'd be interesting to know exactly what's going on there if we go to the serebiansky forest there are claims that the ukrainians have pushed back in the area grayskull here says Pro-Ukrainian channel reports that the AFU has successfully counter-attacked in the Serebiansky forest in a couple of directions. Actually, no, that's uh, right. Interesting. Okay, so that's where we we're just talking about. Um, this is by Bila Harivka. This is actually that's south of the river, Sversky Donetsk River there, and this is north of it. Okay, interesting. So that is to suggest that the Ukrainians have taken this area back and also have control of that part of the hill, which is certainly more charitable than the the Surat maps claims Andrew Perpetua has this whole area in the grey zone um so that that would you know it doesn't contradict what Andrew Perpetua is saying particularly it's just that there's could well be a consolidation in the grey zone to make it Ukrainian controlled but um as it loops down there you've got that sort of oxbow almost uh, oxbow lake uh, I think it is. Yes, it is an Oxbow Lake. There you go. GCC geography got geography got me somewhere. So that that area controlled by the Ukrainians, as according to that source. Um, take a look at the pinch of salt and all that. Uh, right, some fairly significant gains 
uh, for the Ukraine for the Russians around Spirna in the Seversk uh, direction. They have also a tree line moving up towards Ivano Derivka. Uh, again, massive difference between the mappers in this section of the front line where the Ukrainians have, well, the Russians, sorry, have control much further forward as according to uh, Surat maps. A really significant difference there. Then when we come down, I don't know if I can in this iteration, can I put, I don't know if I can right click on this map like I can. No, it won't let me. This is a preview version of Google Maps. Right, then when we come down to Chazy Vyar, interesting that the, uh, either the Russians have been pushed back around Stupochki or it's Surat Maps admitting that they never actually took that area in the first place. So that's good news for the Ukrainians. The Russians haven't made any further gains inside Chazy Vyar. So I think that's very good news there. And also stability around Toretsk and New York is good news for the Ukrainians too. Uh, interesting, but you know some very, albeit very small gains uh, around the north of this front line, the Pokrovsk uh, sector. The Russians making some gains to the north of that sector in the tree lines north of Novo Alexandrivka, um, and that's not something we've seen for a long time. Good news that there's still stability down here because that's where the main Ukrainian trench is. And so it goes to show that fortifications work, right? And then further round the Pokrovsk front and basically right down Vukhodar Pokrovsk. We have huge gains for the Russians here. Um, although that, remember that is four days worth of gains, but there's an acceleration to their gains, isn't there? Uh, so north of Seladove. Uh, west of Seladovy, Vishneve here, another Vishneve. Uh, Nova Alexandrivka, Nola, no, Nova Alexivka, um, almost the same. And further on to the south. So, really substantial gains for the Russians as far as both mappers are concerned. But Surat maps still further to the west. Uh, the Russians are still further to west on Surat maps than on Andrew Perpetua's maps. Then we get to Karakova, where it's basically all happening. Some small gains to the Russians north of the reservoir at Ilinka, which is seeing quite a lot of uh, hard fighting because you know you start losing it here, and basically the, the Russians can just take pot shots at Karakova right from uh, across there the river so or the reservoir so it's, it's looking really challenging for the ukrainians at karakova there is supposedly st fighting street fighting on the outskirts of karakova taking place surat maps has that indicated and some gains further to the south and i'd say these are really substantial gains if they're true uh Sir andrew perpetua actually has that as well so yeah both of them agree and that's a substantial four day uh, four day set of gains there uh, for for both mappers so that's not good news for the ukrainians but if we go back to karakova let's hear a few things about what's going on there so the first thing is that the karakova dam was detonated as russian forces uh, have been seen on the outskirts as i mentioned uh, this is a quote from kiev independent russian forces damaged the dam holding the karakova reservoir in donetsk or blast According to the governor, quote, this attack potentially threatens residents of settlements of the Vodcha River, both in Donetsk and Dnipro Petrovsk oblasts, um, he said. Now, that is really challenging. So you've got the dam, uh, I would have thought, is there. And then you've got a bridge across here as well. But it could be that there are certain different elements of um, infrastructure around there. But uh, this is where, yeah, that's where your dam is. And that is taking a bit of a beating. Now, when it was first happening, people weren't quite sure who it was. It seems that it's the it's Russians that have been hitting that. Um, as Darth Putin says here, somewhat tongue in cheek, although actually, no, not really. So Donald Trump said, I told Putin not to escalate. So the, there's this idea that um, the Russia have been threatened. Putin's been threatened by Putin, uh, by Trump saying you don't escalate or else. And it's interesting that 12 hours later, Russian forces have blown up at the Kurokiv Reservoir Dam floodwaters are approaching villages in Donetsk region. So yet again, a potentially huge crisis developing as the Russians have escalated, blowing up a dam like they did at Novokokovka, where the world sort of sat back and went, that's an absolute travesty. 
it's ecocide it's horrendous it's going to affect so much going forward it's a huge disaster and then we promptly did nothing now don't you dare escalate or else and then putin calls a bluff and what does uh what does trump do i'm not really sure and um, biden doesn't seem to be doing anything either uh okay further to the south past pobieda and towards well i'd say towards vuhladar but look how far vuhladar is now away from everywhere absolute shocker uh, we have some considerable gains for the Russians. And then north of that Vukhtadar front, again, further gains for the Russians. Uh, if you take these imaginary lines, the pink ones there, that's Andrew Perpetua's previous line. So he would now say that the Russians are defensively um, at this point. And the Russians have gained that. We to sort of colour it in. Surat Maps has the darker pins. And you can see that just some smaller areas over here but still still significant under their control huge gains for the russians further to the west so not good news there for the ukrainians uh, they are struggling somewhat to hold back the russians okay uh, let's just talk a little bit about Karakova as we've just been there remind you where that is so we're talking about here see what Rob Lee has to say According to deep state maps, the situation around Karakova is deteriorating. Quote, the enemy continues to carry out their large scale plan to encircle the city from the flanks. As previously stated, the Russians mounting greater pressure on new directions are attempting to reach the logistical paths of the Ukrainian defense forces. And this process is only gaining momentum. The Muscovites are currently attacking Ukrainian military positions from the north, south and east. Their goal is to bypass the city from the flanks and control the N1, N15 Zaporizhia to Donetsk route. At the same time, an unfavourable situation develops in the vicinity of the settlements of Antonivka, Katerinivka and Yeljetivka. We must reiterate that lies will ruin us all. Yet even in attracting greater resources to the vicinity of Krakow, concerns remain about the reasoning behind the deployment. Taking into account the enemy's activity, it's only a matter of time before Krakow is lost. And if we still do not have control of the problem with the flanks, it will quickly turn into another catastrophe. So it's not looking good there, uh, as it's being claimed concerning Karakova. Um, it's, yeah, it seems fairly evident to me that the Russians are, are looking like they're going to take all of this land. You can see here that appears to be the Ukraine defensive line trying to use the natural geography as well to aid them. OK, so it's all happening down there. Now, according to Grace Gold, pro-Ukrainian channels are stating that Ukrainians successfully that the Ukrainian army successfully counterattacked in Nestoryanka in Zaporizhia. So Nestoryanka is further along from um, Myrna. Nestoryanka. Here it is. Okay, so that's not at all what Surat Maps is saying. But let's make sure we know where we are first. Some slight gains for the Russians in and around Staromyorsko to the north of there as they're pushing up the Mokiyali River. Um, and then some gains over past Robotina. So this is a Robotna area, which the Russians have pretty much now completely taken back and, and equalised it. So at Maps has the Russians in control of Nestoryanka and um, yeah, pushing on further forward from there. Not so much agreement though from... Uh, Grace Gold, who says that the Ukrainians have successfully counterattacked in that area. So that is just to the right there as the road bends around. Um, so that is here. Ukrainians in control of this area, which is not in accordance with Syriac maps. But, you know, take either, either claim with a pinch of salt. Right. Now, we are also hearing about another dam. So Russians are preparing to blow up the dam at Vasilivka, Zaporizhia region. They accuse our troops of preparing for a terrorist act. This is really common where the Russians make it, Russians make a claim and all they're doing is really telling you what they're going to do. Uh, so this is probably a fairly safe indication that Russia is going to try and take out that dam. So Russian state agency RIA claims that Ukrainian armed forces are preparing a huge missile strike on Vasilivka Dam in occupied Zaporizhia, claiming 
citing Vladimir Rogov, member of the Russian appointed administration. When announcing such things, Russia intends to, to usually do it themselves, just like they blame the Ukrainians for blowing up Kokovka Dam in the Kherson region, which led to the catastrophe for both civilians and animals living in both banks of the Dnipro River. Well, they appear to be on the verge of doing this at Vazilivka, or at least that's the claim there. So just to remind you where that is, if we come further to the west here, actually it's interesting you don't see the reservoir as it was because the Kof uh, Novokokovka Dam was blown, if you remember, all the way back here, back in time. Where are you? You're down there. So the dam was blown there. This then led to all of... This was much wider, not so much a river as kind of an elongated uh, part of this reservoir that then came up into here. All of this was water. All of this was water and all of this was water. And now, as you can see, water comes down the river, a little bit of a river coming through Kamianska and Vazilivka. Um, uh, yeah, if we're talking about that. Gee, where is Vazilivka? Uh, I have to go and find that out thought that was here anyway um yeah so you can see that as we zoom in it turns to water it renders as it used to look and as we zoom out you can see what it looks like now very different well it was I was, I was being thick here it is just below where i was looking so you've got kamianska so if you remember you've got a river that comes up through here and it comes out into the reservoir at kamianska and here the russians have basically been on the southern side of the the river estuary uh, if you want to call it that uh, and then the ukraine is on the northern side the russians did this daring attack up here but of course this wasn't all water or isn't all water so it's going to look very different um there there so in that that area they attacked north of there and had some success but then were beaten back um, if we come further to the south we've got uh vasilivka here so they could could, appears to be a dam there that is as you can see there's road there road there uh road across here and these these might have um water infrastructural um functions there yeah so it looks like they're planning on blowing a dam there that's the claim and then another claim which has been rumbling on for some time now um, is that Zaporizhia, the Russians are getting ready for a massive attack in Zaporizhia. Russian attack in Zaporizhia or blast expected any day according to the military. The assaults could begin in the near future. We're not even talking about weeks. We're expecting it to happen any day. So the Ukrainian, Ukrainian's uh, southern command spokesperson. So goodness me, I'll talk about how close they are to being in a lot of trouble in terms of personnel and equipment provision the russians but if they're planning on doing another attack in zaporizhia somewhere you know different then they're committing themselves to another point on the front line and it makes you think goodness me their, their uh, draw on troops is just endless uh, seemingly endless so anyway there you go that's the front line update really appreciate that you are here to watch that and support that thank you very much indeed and uh, i will i will speak to you tomorrow uh, in, the in the meantime, take care.